when our earliest human ancestors emerged from that primordial rainforest, they brought violence. We eradicated genomes as we spread our seed across the world, infant masters of a world unready. Once we settled, history began. We oppressed one another, started war over water, food, and slaves. With war came atrocities, not only on the battlefield, but by the chaos that war brought in its wake. Blood coming from all forms of slaughter, as well as more brutal crimes. Among these evils, scalping. Perhaps the most outward expression of human violence. The opening of Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy really stood out to me. It opens with three epigraphs. The first two aren't really important, so I'll just talk about the last one. Clark, who led last year's expedition to the Afar region of northern Ethiopia, and UC Berkeley colleague Tim D. White, also said that a re-examination of a 300,000-year-old fossil skull found in the same region earlier shows evidence of having been scalped. The Yuma Daily Sun, June 13th, 1982. This excerpt immediately sets a tone, and it's evocative, stretching this violence back to the dawn of humanity. Cormac McCarthy is a strange writer. He's rather well known for being somewhat esoteric. His writing is such that it can create strange objects. There can be things that are literally real within the story that could not exist within our world. For example, there's this guy. He's real in the story, but he's so physically strange to us that he's almost prophetic and strangely mystical. McCarthy also doesn't use quotation marks, which is cool. But for the ease of viewing and because I'm quoting, I will be notating such. As well as the fact that all page numbers will be from this copy. Vintage International or something. Ooh. I also want to say there will be discussion of racism and other things you may not like. Sexual assault, extreme violence. If you don't want to hear about that, don't watch this video. If it's bad, it's probably in this book. So click off. This video is going to be comprehensive. So if you have not read the novel, you can understand the video. If you have you'll still gain something from the video. So regardless of your knowledge, you'll get something. Let's quickly dive into the historical background behind Blood Meridian. God, this is going to be a long-ass video. In 1834, continued unrest in northern Mexico culminated in the mostly southern American-settled Texas, declaring its independence. Among its grievances were the new unitary dictatorship and the Mexican ban on slavery. They ultimately won a narrow victory by legally dodgy means, by capturing the president, and gained their independence, although because of the dodginess, Mexico did not officially recognize Texas as an independent nation. So when the U.S. annexed Texas in 1845, this put the American and Mexican governments in immediate conflict. If you didn't know, the U.S. Congress has to declare war. So what did President Polk do to start a war with Mexico? cause a bunch of trouble on their border until Mexico declared war. Essentially, this is what the pre-war borders looked like, with Mexico de facto controlling all of this, and Texas claiming everything up until the Rio Grande, or Rio, Rio Grande? Um, I don't actually know how to say it. Oh, apparently Mexicans call it something different. Uh, and it was a blowout American victory. It ended in a peace treaty that looks like this, although most of this land was actually settled by indigenous nations. And so what happens when the government that doesn't really care about you or bother you because they're falling apart changes to the government that has a proven track record with removing, resettling, and forcibly integrating your people? You've probably heard about scalping. I mentioned it a bit ago, and it's a very large part of this story. Scalping is most commonly associated with indigenous America, where it was far more common in warfare than most other places, although not unheard of in the old world. It was something that civilized Europeans used to prove their superiority. But have you asked yourself, who brought the violence? Who brought guns, money, and disease, and domesticated animals, and outright conquest? This like Blood Meridian, brings up the issue of anti-colonial violence. To what degree are a colonized people morally at fault for actions against their colonizer? 
I think this book fundamentally understands anti-colonial violence from a white perspective in that it is brutal and often disgusting, but pales in comparison to what it fights against. Oftentimes, native war parties would sack small frontier villages, pillage, kidnap, murder, and often scalp. But something important to realize is that the new local administrations would often put bounties on native scalps of any age. This added a disgusting order and bureaucracy uh, to it that there was not in indigenous nations. White Americans did far worse, annihilating the people who fought back and systematically forcing anybody else onto reservations. That is how a lot of the West was tamed. And, well, Blood Meridian is set in this world between American conquest, Mexican caudillos, and older nations. To quote the back of my copy, the market for Indian scalps is thriving. Blood Meridian follows the kid. The opening is an oddly poetic description of his early life. See the child. The story describes his miserable life and his nightly birth under the Leonids in 1833. The kid's face is curiously untouched and his eyes are oddly innocent. He eventually leaves at 14 and attempts to find a better life. His journey takes him along the Mississippi and eventually to Nacogdoches. At a revival listening to a preacher, we first meet the other main character, an enormous man dressed in oilcloth slicker. He was bald as a stone, and he had no trace of beard. He was close on to seven feet in height. This is Judge Holden. He becomes a more primary character later, and this description makes him seem surreal, oddly evil and malevolent. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel it is my duty to inform you the man holding this revival is an imposter. He holds no papers of divinity from any institution. He is altogether devoid of the least qualification to the office. In truth, the gentleman standing here before you posing as a minister of the Lord is not only totally illiterate, but also wanted by the law in the states of Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Arkansas on a variety of charges, the most recent of which involved a girl of 11 years, whom he was surprised in the act of violating while actually clothed in the livery of his God. Before the commotion, the kid leaves, and the tent erupts into gunfire. The kid happens upon the judge in a bar later. The judge admits to have lied just to cause chaos. In Nacogdoches, in Na in Na dude, what the fuck? In Nacogdoches, the kid also meets Louis Toadvine, a branded criminal, and they have a friendly bond. In this friendship, they try to burn a man alive over a dispute and end up having to leave the town separately. As he rides out alone, when the kid looked back, the judge smiled. As he rides west, he comes upon an old slaver whom he stays the night with. This is a hungry country. I come from Mississippi. I was a slaver. Don't care to tell of that. The man tells him of the country he finds himself in. A man's at odds to know his mind, because his mind is all he has to do it with. He can know his heart, but he doesn't want to. Best not to look in there. You can find meanness in the least of creatures. But when God made man, the devil was at his elbow. The kid shrugs him off and heads off back on the prairie next day. Soon, he will find himself in San Antonio, and he meets Captain White's company. White is a cruel imperialist, and he takes a band of American irregulars to go filibustering, or illegally crossing into and making trouble in another country. When him and another man go to meet White, he sits on top of his desk, and he speaks to the boy. He speaks of Mexico and of his mission. What we're dealing with is a race of degenerates, a mongrel race, little better than <laughs> hell. There's no God in Mexico, a people manifestly incapable of governing themselves. Colonel Carrasco is asking for American intervention and he's going to get it. Sonora will become a United States territory and there will be a section of land for every man in my company. White strongly urges the kid to join the company. He refers to him as man. Without anything much better to do, he joins up. It gets him something to do, and more importantly, a meager amount of equipment, although the company is irregularly fitted. On the way out of town, a Mennonite yells out to them. Do you cross that river with yon filibuster armed? You'll not cross it back. The wrath of God lies sleeping. Hell ain't half full. You carry war onto a foreign land. You'll wake more than the dogs. 
They ride deep into the plains and wild dust of Mexico. The next bit follows their menial days of travel while filibustering, until they encounter some burning coals, and soon a band of riders, maybe ragged Indians, or perhaps Mexicans. As White surveys the land before him, hundreds of ponies veer off and make directly for them. There rose a fabled horde of mounted lancers and archers, a legion of horribles, hundred in number, half naked or clad in costumes out of fevered dream. Pieces of uniform with the blood of prior owners, coats of slain dragoons, frogged and braided cavalry jackets, a stovepipe hat, the armor of a Spanish conquistador, all howling in a barbarous tongue and riding down upon them like a horde from a hell, more horrible yet than the brimstone land of Christian reckoning, screeching and yammering. Oh. My. God. Says the sergeant. A drove of arrows descends upon them, and rifle smoke fills the air. The lancers slam into the company. The kid sits, desperately trying to fight or make some sense of the chaos. Many try to reload, or beat the horsemen in melee, and others still were speared or scalped standing. I don't really want to describe the rest of this, so I'm not going to. At the end, the company groaned and gibbered, and horses lay screaming. The kid escapes and later meets up with a wounded soldier named Sproul. He states that eight of them, including the captain, escaped. They make a hard few days, sharing small blankets in caves, and coming upon scenes of carnage. On their way into town, the kid is dragged away by a large crowd at some sort of peculiar wild parade, it's like a festival day, and pulled to a glass container with a head in it. It was Captain White. He has drowned and sightless eyes. The kid looks around as the crowd glares, and he spits a fiery condemnation. He ain't no kin to me. The kid is thrown in jail, alongside three others from the company. One of the boys is horrified, saying it's the worst thing he'd ever seen. The kid further removes himself from White's command. Somebody ought to have picked a little long time ago. By rights, they ought to pick a mine for ever taking up with such a fool. The kid and the others are sent to Chihuahua City. He is thrown in jail once more. How do you like the city life? He sees a familiar face. It's Toadvine. I, <laughs> I just realized I had no Toadvine dialogue from like the first chapter in here. So you did not recognize that at all. And that's really funny. Arr! Soon enough, a pack of vicious looking humans comes through. The rough company armed with assorted weaponry and just with various human and animal materials. Foremost among them, outsized and childlike with his naked face, rode the judge, bowing to the ladies. This reeking horde is not led by the judge. It's led by a small, black-haired man. Toadvine says, His name is Glenn. He's got a contract with the Trias. They're to pay him $100 a head for scalps. I told him there was three of us. Gentlemen, we're getting out of this shithole. So they get out of jail. And they join up with Glanton's company. Over the next few months, and by weight, like most of the book, uh, <laughs> the gang roams throughout the countryside, pillaging, scalping, and wreaking havoc. They return to Chihuahua and get paid for it. They debauch in Chihuahua City, and then broke, leave town to pillage some more. This is the fundamental cycle of this part of the novel. I will now describe some key events during this period of the book. I won't be totally comprehensive, but this is a general idea of some of the major events. They stop at the outskirts of town, Chihuahua City, and pick up their new revolvers. There are 48 of them. If you're wondering what guns looked like at the time, um... The pack ride out with a pair of pistols each. We are introduced to the Jacksons, a white and black man with identical names and a shared hatred of one another. The Delawares, some native scouts from the East Coast, who only ever really confer with Glanton. And Bathcat, a Welsh Tasmanian fugitive who wears a necklace of ears. Keep this in mind, it may become important later. Wears ragged clothes, has many scars, and carries an expensive fancy rifle. He falls in with Toadvine, and the two of them bet on which Jackson will kill the other first. Bathcat also comments to the kid and Toadvine about their inexperience. 
he has hunted natives in Australia, and soon the three begin to form some sort of a clique. They pass through a hacienda and meet the jugglers, a family of itinerant magicians, who are thematically important. The jugglers, speaking Spanish, give out several tarot cards. Tobin, ex-priest and future clique member, tells Black Jackson it's idolatry, Blackie. Idolatry. Do not mind her. Black Jackson takes a card at the judge's recommendation. It's the fool, which generally means something like spontaneity, new beginnings, or originality. The judge now calls for the kid. Young Blasarius yonder. The kid pulls out the Four of Cups, typically interpreted as something like an unhealthy relationship to the past, depression, regret, or missed opportunities. The judge laughs silently. Glanton even pulls one, and maybe sees it as they're shuffling or whatever. I don't know how tarot works, so I don't know what that means, but he is hostile towards them, as they say he pulled the chariot, inverted. This means something like a lack of direction, forcefulness, and aggression, which is rather fitting. Many nights later, uh, the Jacksons have another fight, this time with threats of violence and pistols drawn. After retreating into the darkness, Black Jackson emerges once more, and, with a single stroke, swapped off his head. White Jackson's head. This is something of a rebirth for Jackson, and he will continue his descent for the rest of his time. Out of all present, this happens closest to Tobin, the ex-priest, and he continues for the rest of the novel to show signs that he may not have entirely left his priestly life behind. The party comes upon a caldera, with several abandoned mud houses, there's a group of four men and a boy hiding in the town from native raiders. In the cold night, the judge is seen naked atop the walls. The next morning, someone found the boy. The Mexican boy in the town is found naked and dead with his neck broken. You can assume what happened here, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, it. It just it might happen again. So Tobin chats with the kid about the judge. He implores the kid to study him. The man's a hand at everything. He could outdance the devil himself. He can shoot, track, and ride, and speaks five languages. Him and the governor, they sat up till breakfast. The governor's a learned man himself, he is, but the judge... The kid tells Tobin that he's seen the judge before, and Tobin has too. This is an entire chapter, and this is what Tobin describes, abridged. We come off little Colorado. We didn't have a pound of powder in the company. There he sat on a rock in the middle of the greatest desert. We were 38 men when we left Chihuahua City and were 14 when the judge found us. Mortally whipped on the run. About the meridian of that day, we come upon the judge on his rock. Just the one. No horse, just him and his legs crossed, smiling as we rode up, like he'd been expecting us. Land just study him. We have a secret commerce. Some terrible covenant. Soon they was conversing like brothers. And all this time, the judge spoke hardly a word. He seemed not to take his eyes from that dead cone like a great chancre. We climbed on. It was brimstone. The judge dumped out the charcoal and the niter and stirred them. The judge on his knees, kneading the mass with his naked arms. Well, it would have brought tears to your eyes. He turns to us, the judge, with that smile of his, and he says, Gentlemen! That was all he said. He commenced to kill Indians. God, it was butchery. At the first fire, we killed a round dozen, and we did not let up. And that was the judge the first I ever saw him. Ah, here's a thing to study. They ride on as before. They begin to follow a small village of natives, silently tracking their campfires and making none themselves. They crouch in the early morning to hide themselves, and Glanton is tactically adept worrying as to the number in the small village. J the judge just insists, There's enough to go around. The hour that followed was a long hour. They ride into the village, and the violence is general. Pistol balls and clubs and knives cause an absolute bedlam. They begin to murder the women and children, and those slow who try and run. They swing babies into rocks and are wading in blood. They scalp and murder them standing or waiting for their flailing to cease as they drown in the nearby lake. And soon they have killed every single soul, or driven them to the waters where they will collect their prizes. 
Glanton even kills a Mexican in the gang and scalps him. They fight their way from the riders who were absent at the raid, and the judge is seen coddling a small Apache boy. The company all look at him, and he's said to have dead eyes. The narration even refers to the boy as it. The judge is seen in the morning with the boy, and ten minutes later, seen wiping a small scalp on his trousers. Toadvine is disgusted. God damn you, Holden. Putting his pistol to the great dome of Holden's head. You either shoot or take that away. Do it now. This kind of fatalistic ambivalence is recurring for the judge. And in the entire story, few people are brave enough to even try something like this. So, on the 21st of July, in the year 1849, they rode into the city of Chihuahua to a hero's welcome. They bore on poles the desiccated heads of the enemy through that fantasy of music and flowers. They buy, party, spend, and thrift through the city with their new coin. Within days, they run out of money and are seen sleeping all over, terrorizing the citizenry. Only two weeks after arriving, they leave again. Later in their travels, the gang nears the Texas border, and Glanton rides out alone to watch the land before him. The land that, 400 miles to the east, were the wife and child that he would not see again. His shadow grew long before him. He would not follow. This adds an almost tragic tone to Glanton. Uh, they bring destruction everywhere, riding to the mountains and back with hundreds of bloodied, knotted scalps. After a tussle in a cantina, the gang all looks at Glanton, and down at the bodies. Hair hey, boys! The string ain't run on this trade yet. They soon do this in another Mexican village and are met by chivalrous Mexican cavalry in armor who are dispersed by the Americans. They go back to Chihuahua once more. They enter the city haggard and filthy and reeking with the blood of the citizenry for whose protection they had been contracted. The bounty is rescinded and within a week there will be 8,000 pesos on Glanton's head. They ride out towards the evening lands and the distant pandemonium of the sun. The sun is used like this as a violent symbol several times. Their previously bountiful loop now turns more destructive. They wreak havoc on towns and then flee with gunfire. Mexican towns, white towns, European towns. In this time, the judge says one of the most telling things in the entire novel. Whatever in creation exists without my knowledge exists without my consent these anonymous creatures. They may seem little or nothing in the world, yet the smallest crumb can devour us. Only nature can enslave a man, and only when the existence of each last entity is routed out and made to stand naked before him will he be properly suzerain of the earth. That man who sets himself the task of singling out the threat of order will by decision alone have taken charge of the world. He studies objects, he takes little artifacts, and studies them, sketches them, before he throws them into the fire. Oh, I also forgot to mention, there's a, like, a smaller character in the gang called uh, named David Brown, but he really does not do anything until the end. So, they get a bounty from Sonora for scalps, but on their way to raid, they are chased terribly by General Elias, who I think is this guy? Um check actually i'm i'm interested i'll i'll put something over here about how i found this image but it's like another elias's grandfather who's around the time hopefully this is actually right this is kind of interesting elias leads 500 cavalry and does not relent they lose three and seven are wounded in the first skirmish alone this continues for days and glanton is strangely calm in the face of it the kid is separated from command at a certain point, and runs desperately through the countryside, seeing the others who have been lost, making his way treacherously across the snowy peaks and desolate valleys. The kid even kills a Mexican soldier in this time, but cannot bring himself to put a wounded gang member out of his misery. He passes by burning trees, alone in the desert, and sleeps atop rocky promontories, with an almost inspiring perseverance. I think a burning tree is a religious metaphor thing. I want to say Moses. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a religious expert. After this, he regroups with Glanton and the gang. They look bloody, used up, powder black. And in their dark sockets, Glanton's eyes were burning centroids of murder. 
that stared balefully at the kid. They had pretty much the same experience as the kid, and fought on the desert in snow, stuck perilously between a war party of Apache ahead and the Mexican Corps behind them, all the while losing yet more men. They eventually make it to Santa Cruz. The judge, from now on, takes his ceremonial role to a greater extent. He calls a man for help to slaughter an animal, and Tobin leans to the kid. Pay him no mind, lad. To which the kid says, You think I'm afraid of him? Riding through mountains, the company comes upon several of their scouts, including some Delawares and Bath Cat, eviscerated. R.A.P. are Van Diemen Lander. I gotta say, it's the most disgusting description in the novel, in my opinion. They're like flayed and mutilated. Yeah. They suffered and died impartially. Davy Brown takes Bathcat's ear necklace. Remember, remember this. Eventually entering Tucson, at this time legally Mexican, but occupied by an American force. They find the idiot, a very disabled man who the judge decides to take under his wing. Jackson causes trouble in a saloon, and the gang indulges themselves. After the garrison's questioning, the judge pretends to be a legal professional, and eventually, after a young girl is found raped and killed by, well, the text doesn't say, they leave at dusk. In three days, they reach the Yuma River crossing. During this time at the Yuma River crossing, the gang's violent nature comes to a peak. It's run by a doctor, and waging the possibility of attacks from nearby natives, the gang become the real authority. The owner gets along well with the Yumas, and they have his implicit permission to camp nearby. Without permission, Glanton takes charge of an old bronze howitzer on a hill, and uses it to drive the Yumas out. They slaughter men, women, and children out of nihilistic habit. They scalp them. There's no bounty on scalps here. They do it because it's all they know how to do. The general pillaging, however, misses many of the Yuma, and the gang does not pursue them. They have absolute authority at the ferry. They rob, harass, and murder locals, as well as poor migrants, taking in massive sums of money, and leaving probably dozens slain. They enslave some Sonorans, many girls and children, and all the while, Glanton seemed to take little account of the wealth they were amassing. At this point, the storylines get a little bit jumbled. David Brown, Webster, and Toadvine head for San Diego to get supplies and spend some of this wealth. They make it, and Brown gets thrown in jail for threatening a gunsmith. Toadvine and Webster go back to camp. Seeing that they've come back missing the supplies and Brown, Glanton goes with five men to San Diego. This leaves the judge in charge at the ferry. Glanton ties up some innocents and threatens them for information, and, learning they know none, and seeing his men leave for the gold fields, he rides back to the crossing alone. The camp is empty. There are small girls caged and cowering. The doctor even comes to Glanton, speaking of that man who has terrorized the land. Holden and Jackson are seen clad in loose robes and nothing else. A few pages ago, too, the idiot gets his rebirth. He is given a bath and almost drowns. He is carried out, baptized, by the judge. Through the night, revelry is general. The shrieks of young girls carried across the water. It seems that the judge has completed his spiritual conversion of the Legion. Early in the next morning, before the sun is up, Jackson goes for a piss in the river. He is shot through the abdomen by a long cane arrow. He reaches for his absent firearm and is shot through the thigh. Slowly, drifting down the river, bleeding out. The Yumas swarm up the hill. They kill several, including the doctor, and soon enter Glanton's chambers. His room is like a debauched feudal baron. The leader among them takes his large wooden axe, decorated entirely, and Glanton spits. Hack away, you me red- Wow, what an end. His body is thrown into a bonfire with the others that died. The judge has a different fate. Carrying the howitzer, he blasts several back and leaves with the idiot close by his side. The kid and Toadvine too. They escape, uh, fighting a running engagement upriver. And the kid is wounded, although not terribly. It 
does faster. They keep their fight into the foothills, and soon enough are hailed by the ex-priest, Tobin. At a well, they see the judge and his scion. He badgers Toadvine for his hat and makes some disgusting scraps of meat to share. Tobin and the kid leave, and the judge calls up. We are all here together. Yonder sun is like the eye of God. We will cook impartially, I do assure you. The kid heads down and drinks, but soon goes back up. The judge calls, offering him some coins for his pistol. Tobin urges the kid to kill the judge while he can. Do him, you'll get no second chance, lad. Do it. He's naked, he's unarmed. Do it for the love of God. Do it or I swear your life is forfeit. He does not kill Holden. They leave and travel treacherously across the barren and desolate desert, filled with long dead men, horse bones, and ashes from abject decay. They are happened upon by Brown. He inquires of several of the other men in the company and rides off with his rifle and horse. Soon the kid and Tobin are harassed, pursued frighteningly by Holden, now with Brown's clothing and rifle, and the imbecile with Toadbine's hat. This kind of implies he killed both of them. For days they are attacked and chased by the pair, and he taunts them at night, standing against the horizon. Tobin is shot. The blood was running between his fingers. They escape on foot, Holden on foot as well, and in a brief moment of respite, hide under an old wagon. The judge yells to them, taunts them, and Tobin tells the kid to cover his ears. The kid does not. He ain't nothing. You told me yourself. Men are made from the dust of the earth. You said it was no par parable, that it was a naked fact, that the judge was a man like all men. Then the two villains pass over the horizon. Tobin and the kid are found by some peaceful Indians and are nursed to better health. So they get to San Diego, and the kid wanders to the water. He sees a solitary horse upon the incomprehensive stars. After the two part ways, Tobin's fate is ambiguous. His faith has lost. The kid is carried to jail by a patrol, and he awakens one day to find the judge just outside of his cell. The kid stands against the far wall, defiant to Holden's attempts to touch him. The kid is freed from prison, and he goes to the surgeon. He makes a slow but successful recovery. The next summer, he is in Los Angeles, and he finds the hanged bodies of Toadvine and Brown. They had lived, and the kid takes Brown's necklace of ears, previously bath cats. He works at various establishments, sees many people from many different places, he sees men killed, women fought over, and the most vicious of wild beasts. He hears word of Holden, yet none of the ex-priest, and he passes restlessly through the plains. He grows older, and he labors still. He carries himself over wicked terrain, and the ancient violence it holds. The story advances by several years now. It is 1878. It was previously 1850. We find him on the plains of North Texas. The kid is now the man. I will now refer to the kid as the man. Millions of buffalo carcasses. One of them asks about the necklace, and he shrugs it off telling the truth of it. Cannibals, they must have been, the boy implies. The man says, There wasn't cannibals, there was Apaches. I knowed the man that docked them, knowed him and rode with him and seen him hung. Showing an interesting respect for those he once fought. The boy, Elrod, is only 16. The country is filled with violent children orphaned by war. He rides down to Fort Griffin and orders a whiskey at the saloon. But watching him across the layered smoke. In the yellow light was the judge. There's a fight. At its end, the judge appears next to the man. I'd say they're all gone under now, saving me and thee, would you not? The man attempts to look past him, but the judge is just too immense. The man stares on and tries to disregard him. And some are not yet born who shall have cause to curse. Plenty of time for the dance. I ain't studying no dance. I got to go. <laughs> go? What man would not be a dancer if he could? It's a great thing, the dance. You were a disappointment to me. Even so, at the last, I find you here with me. I ain't with you. The judge leans closer yet. Don't look away! We are not speaking in mysteries. 
You of all men are no stranger to that. The emptiness and the despair. It is that which we take arms against. What do you think death is? What is death if not an agency? And whom does he intend toward? Look at me! I don't like your craziness. Do gods of vengeance and of compassion alike lie sleeping in their crypt? The same silence, and that is this silence which will prevail. A man seeks his own destiny and no other. Each man's destiny is as large as the world he inhabits. All opposites as well. This desert upon which so many have been broken is vast, it is hard, and it is barren. Its very nature is stone. I've been everywhere. This is just one more place. As war becomes dishonored, those honorable men who recognize the sanctity of blood will become excluded from the dance. And yet there will be one there always who is a true dancer, and can you guess who that might be? You ain't nothing. Only the man who has offered himself entire to the blood of war, seen horror in the round and learned at last that it speaks to his inmost heart, only that man can dance. All others are destined for a night that is eternal and without name. The man is dragged away by a prostitute. The services of her are refused by him, and he walks down to see the dance floor. A ring of people had taken to the floor and were holding hands, and grinning and calling out to one another. The dance begins, and the man walks out back to the jakes, or the outhouses. The air is cold, and in the night, the voices of the dance fade. Then he opened the rough board door of the jakes and stepped in. The judge was seated upon the closet. He was naked, and he rose up, smiling, and gathered him in his arms against his immense and terrible flesh, and shot the wooden bar latch home behind him. The dance continues inside, and two men walk out to the jakes. A third man was standing there, urinating into the mud. Okay, so I've made that crickets joke a couple times now, uh, with just some text on screen. That's minor mistakes. Uh, this was a major mistake. This is a pivotal moment in the story, and it makes no sense the way I wrote it with the voice acting. Uh, so I, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the files was really funny. There's a really funny take where uh, you can hear me laughing in the background. I wouldn't go in there, Faz, you. I wouldn't go in. Okay. Okay, turn it down. Just... <laughs> so what basically happens is these men walk out and see another man, the third man, uh, peeing in the dirt. And then these two men are like, hey, why are you peeing in the dirt? And he's like, I wouldn't go in there if I was you. And then uh, they open the door and one of them says, good God almighty. I'm ho I hope I'm quoting that correctly. Uh, and then closes the door and walks back inside. So it's pretty much said that uh, he finds the kid or the man in a very disgusting state after the judge has killed him. And I honestly think it's brilliant to make you have to imagine it. Anyway, inside the bar, the dance is roaring. There are dancing fiddlers, all of them drunk. Some even took off clothes, the board slamming under the jackboots. Above all, the judge towers, naked, dancing as well. Bowing and going throughout the crowd, he takes a fiddle and pirouettes and makes a pass, two passes, dancing and fiddling at once. He never sleeps. He says that he will never die. He dances in the light and in the shadow, and he is a great favorite. He never sleeps, the judge. He's dancing, dancing. He says that he will never die. The End no, 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 don't fade, don't fade. There's an epilogue. The epilogue describes a man making many holes in a line in the prairie. I'm guessing for offense? I don't know. As several wanderers watch, they eventually leave. Honestly, the epilogue isn't that important, but uh, I, I certainly could use a thematic palate cleanser after all. Something I haven't made clear yet is that the Glanton gang was real. They did get bounties from northern Mexican states and were chased from several of them. They did go to the Yuma Crossing and were slaughtered there. Most of this information comes from Samuel Chamberlain, an apparent member, and he wrote a memoir about it. Here we can, <coughs> Here we can find some of the few contemporary descriptions of the gang and a few sketches from Chamberlain, including Glanton and the judge.
McCarthy used much of this information in his novel. Real people did this. Not exactly like this, but brutality nonetheless. There is nothing about these arrivals to suggest even the discovery of the wheel. They make a mockery of the nation. They pillage and post up in small towns and threaten their young girls. They're stained, and they are exactly what they think they fight against. Never do the natives in the story pillage because they think it's right. I can't think of a good example where any native war party actually kills innocent people. Uh, they might somewhere in the text, but especially those that they've been contracted to help. Glanton proves himself a capable military leader, but the judge bears the spiritual responsibility, a role that he will expand upon as the novel progresses. The company goes through a large change throughout the story. Their actions are almost all the same, but their motivations, aspirations, and spirit drain throughout. The judge's ideology seems almost corrupting. They go from their bounties, terrible atrocities for money, and safety, to that terror being all they know. They don't just kill for money. By the end, they kill by habit. Let's quickly analyze a couple smaller characters. The Delawares are interesting. Uh, they are frequently seen scouting ahead, and they're described as silent and only knowing of war. Uh, generations driven from the eastern shore to the bloodlands of the west. They have been corrupted by the white ways of war, of expansion, of endless bloodshed. Both Jackson and the idiot are like the judge's thralls. They are men who have risen up to a new level of confidence, power, and violence. The idiot does this by being bathed and embracing salvation, whereas Jackson usurps his destiny by killing his white counterpart. Toadvine is ultimately a criminal, an outlaw. He's not a good man. Yet he's not wholly consumed by nihilist determinism. Bathcat, too. He was raised on theft and slaughter of aborigines, and he does not become as consumed as the others in the company. But he still pisses off a bridge and fires at small puppies. They're not supposed to be good men. They are not good men. They're supposed to be regular, products of their upbringing, their places, and their times, and both are not able to overcome the path they're on, although on occasion they show a disdain for the morality of their path. Tobin on many occasions contests the judge's reasoning, arguing the goodness yet impotence of God. Men of God and men of war have strange affinities. I'll not second say you and your notions. He acts pious. Tobin has left the Jesuit life but he still believes, still has faith. This represents an almost deist belief in God's non-intervention. Tobin leaves. We don't know what happens to him, because it doesn't matter. God has lost, and whether hiding in shame or dead, things have taken his place. Time for the big analysis! <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Judge and Glanton as one here. Thematically, they have somewhat of a symbiotic relationship. They are seen in one point as donning complementing white and black suits. At several points, the Judge takes the real administrative authority over the gang, actually doing the work. The Judge is described as inimical. He has a vast abhorrence. And despite his less put-together appearance, Glanton holds a spark that the Judge does not. Maybe this difference, this ability to guilt and moral inability, is what brings them together, what their terrible covenant implies. When speaking to a garrison of Mexican soldiers, the judge speaks proper Spanish, and Glanton calls them half-ass looking. Glanton is just racist. Glanton tests revolvers by shooting at a cat and goat. He murders an innocent woman in a rather disgusting manner in Chapter 7. There's a fist-sized hole in her head and all sorts of other gross descriptions about it. He proceeds to scalp her remorseless. However, I think it's also abundantly clear that Glanton is human. He's a man who sees the world. He has emotion. It's said when confronted with a beautiful view, its perfection was not lost on him. He often stares into the fire, watching it, like he can see the ocean that he will never grace, or see the men he's lost, or the family he'll never return to. Yet, he does not stare in grief, he lets it all be, lets all consequences continue, and lets fate decide, all the while retaining his humanity, that all the while retaining his humanity that he usurped to contain within him. He's a terrible person, but he is a person. Glanton is not beholden to fate. He's not reliant upon the divine, nor does he, like the judge, view his existence as a struggle against it. 
he must find excuses for atrocities, a reason to kill, a purpose that is not his life behind or fate ahead. That is what the judge enviously envies in him, that ability to be. Still, though, Glanton is weak, and his resignation to fate is what causes his demise. The judge is different. He collects old things, sketches and studies them, and throws them into the fire when he's done. He's said to have seemed much satisfied with the world, as if his counsel had been sought at its creation. He continues doing this, describing that it is his way to create order for himself. In response to, God don't lie, the judge says, No, he does not. And these are his words. Nearer to the end, the judge implies that he personally knows God, or fate. He views his life as part of a journey already accomplished and he views trifling that fate to be tantamount to usurping God. However, he does not see this as just testing the water, seeing what might happen. He believes that by putting as many pieces of the world together as possible, he will be able to attain his own control over his destiny. Your heart's desire is to be told some mystery. The mystery is that there is no mystery. Even in this world, more things exist without our knowledge than with it. The order in creation like a string in a maze, so that you shall not lose your way. More than his personal fatalist philosophy, he represents a thing, war. He is a Cormac McCarthy character. He's not just the devil or some evil construct. He's the cold, calculating part of violence, the kind of well-thought-out, first-degree slaughter that Glanton could never participate in. The freedom of birds is an insult to him. He pokes, prods, and grasps men's heads with his gargantuan hands to test their will. He indulges himself. He almost has a curtsying conception of himself. Holden does not lie about it. He does not attempt to make himself reasonable, find a way by bigotry or vengeance to extricate himself from mercy. The ending is telling, thematically. It is not the tragic death of our protagonist, but the judge's continued attempts at the usurpation of his own fate. I don't blame the people who think he is purely symbolic. He is so savagely inhuman, so devoid of concepts of moral virtue and emotion, that it's hard to see him as real. How could a real man do this? That's what I think makes him so terrifying. He is real, despite his strange piety, respect of God, and complete moral absentia, which in any conceivable man might be the most terrifying thing possible. A man not persuaded by God, but a man who wants to be God, and has the conviction to try. <laughs> The kid is not the kid is not a particularly interesting character. He's pretty damn typical. But I think in the vile and strange world of Blood Meridian, his mostly regular traits are sublimated into morality, fearlessness, and a stoic attitude. From the second chapter, the hermit frames the whole story, telling the kid of the hungry country he will fight so hard against. He does, and he does for a long time. It takes decades, but it eventually does take him. When Shelby, the man he comes across wounded from the gang, asks for him to kill him, saying, it's a terrible place to die in, the kid says, where's a good one? He becomes so used to violence that he almost kills a peaceful native man who touches his gun. The kid's most telling moments are his moments of passion, and mostly hatred, where he spits his hatred for Holden and withstands his attempts to take him to his level. As he noted disdain for the soldier, the joiner, and he says as much to Sproul. The kid does not let the path take him, let the river go around him, and he has a disappointment, almost pity when a man falls so easily to the path. Captain White says to him, I think you mean to make your mark in this world, am I wrong? Maybe that purpose is to withstand the current. He later condemns White and wishes he'd never seen him, or never joined. All of that, I believe, comes from his bold withstanding, his ability to resist the river, but not falter if it does take him for a time. Maybe the tarot card he drew was right. Maybe he does have an unhealthy relationship with the past, and maybe he lives. Maybe he has emotion. Maybe he is human. The kid takes no effort to kill Judge Holden, but I think to imply that this could be cowardice or foolishness would be wrong. This is bravery, because when the world beats him up, he does not try and take it down with him. He stands in front of it, and he challenges it. The kid ends up tossed away, worthless, but fate or not, the man who is a victim of the judge is wiser than a man who dances along. The kid knows he will struggle. He knows he is in war, in depravity. He knows he will have to do horrible things on the path that he takes. And he accepts this with a stoic absolution. 
And that is the most brave thing any character does in the entire book. Blood Meridian is a masterpiece, a rating I don't give out lightly. I'm not particularly well read or uh, the best media critic, assuming I am one, but this book captured me. There are other more subtle books, more traditional books, other masterpieces, but I don't think I've ever read anything so viscerally bloody and unabashedly correct than Blood Meridian. And here it leaves me clapping at the horror. It's a tough read, but there wasn't a single moment where I wasn't entirely consumed by the carnage before me. And it strikes me as brave to defy everything I thought I knew to be good and decent. Blood Meridian is a masterpiece, and above all that, the best book I've ever read. If you think you can take the violence and horror in this book, please go read it if you want to. It's so, it's so much more than what I've described in this video. I had to leave so many things out. So please go, like, you know, check it out or whatever. Blood Meridian makes no claim to describe exactly what scenarios cause war, what makes man fall to it, or exactly how morally calculable any of that would be. Instead, I think it says something far more important. Men are born for games. Every child knows this. The humiliation of defeat and the pride of victory. The trial of chance or trial of worth. All games aspire to the condition of war. What more certain validation of a man's worth could there be? Seen so, war is the truest form of divination. It is the testing of one's will. War is the ultimate game because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. No matter what society, what culture, what time period, no matter what, when times get rough, or defense is needed, or someone hits first, whatever may cause war, or whenever it may arise, war is gone. Uh, hi there. There's no real post credits here. I'm about to go film a retrospective about the whole thing, so that should be dropping a couple hours after this video, uh, if I am planning correctly. Thank you so much for watching.